Ross. John, how are you? Good. good, how are you? I'm good. I'm coming to you on a handheld cell phone rather than an earpiece because we've yes. been having some technical difficulties. Right. But we can hear each other quite well now, and it doesn't sound like Neil Armstrong talking from the moon, so I guess we're good to go. All right. Um, so We could regale the listeners with more tales of our technical difficulties, but maybe we should just go right in. Yeah, let's just, no, let's just dive in um, and start with a piece that you just wrote about, um, mm -hmm. I'm, I, well, why don't you tell me what it's about, because it's about Michael Bloomberg, right. it's about David Broder, give us the summary. Right, well, it's about um, Michael Bloomberg and Michael Bloomberg-ism, and, 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 I, and, and a worldview I sort of defined as um, uh, partisanship scolds, people who believe that, that the central problem with American politics is argument. And disagreement, and that essentially that the solutions are obvious to all, and all we simply have to do is get the parties together or have an independence uh, in the White House, and that will cause people to stop arguing, start agreeing, and do all the things that everyone agrees are needed to be done. Um, so I'm trying to sort of define that view. I argued against it and cited Bloomberg as being now the kind of the, the hero of this movement. Right. Um, along maybe with Arnold Schwarzenegger, um, who, right. with whom he just shared a cover of Time magazine, which in a certain way embodies this tendency in American journalism, I think. I, um, I think the, the mainstream yes. glossy magazines are, because they have an, an interest in appearing nonpartisan, um, they, ha they also thus have an interest in extolling bipartisanship, even when it's either content-free or... Well, what you, what you said in the, in the uh, TRB piece, I think, was was actually completely right that what what tends to be described as bipartisanship is in fact just centrist liberalism that dare not speak its name. Yeah, I don't think that's always the case, but I think it's quite often the case, um, more often than not, and it's definitely the case here, because here you've got, you know, in, this, in the time piece especially, and in the Bloomberg's candidacy, you've got a set of issues, um, global warming, health care, uh, was a stem cell research, right. Uh, basically, you've got um, the Democratic agenda. Right. Um, anti -po more anti-poverty programs, I think. Right. Uh, yeah. Yeah, you've got um, something very close to the Democratic agenda. Uh, and, 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 and there's very strenuous efforts to pretend that it's not the Democratic agenda because you've got a lot of people who are heavily invested in seeing themselves as being um, bipartisan. That's just the key to their whole worldview. So to sort of admit that it's not bipartisan would just uh, make their head explode. Right. I mean, I, and I think, um, I mean, there are, there are a lot of sort of forces at work pushing in different ways at this narrative. One of the forces mm -hmm. that I find interesting is um, the, the claim, I mean, part of the reason that these people can perceive themselves as bipartisan is because mm -hmm. they get attacked not only from the right, but from the left as well. Um, right. and, and, and so, you know, there's this sort of narrative um, on the left that I think is, is partially accurate that's, you know, that says, oh... It, it usually starts out as a narrative about media bias, um, and it's associated right. with Eric Alterman, among others. And the, the narrative mm -hmm. goes, you know, conservatives say that the press is liberal, but really the press is center-right because it is, you know, center-right on economic policy and in hoc to its corporate paymasters on, on, on other issues and so on. Um, and so I think that actually, that plays into this in a way because, and, you, and I think you see this with, actually with a figure like, like Joe Klein, um, who... who, mm -hmm. who in, in his uh, columns and now in his blog for Time magazine, uh, he, he's actually, you know, he, he self-defines as a liberal rather than as a sort of beyond partisanship type right. figure. But he also identifies, I think, in spirit with the idea of the beyond partisanship notion and the fact that he is, a, mm -hmm. you know, in certain ways a conventional center-left figure dovetails quite right. nicely. Yeah, no, I, I, I think that's that's right. I, I, I don't want to pick on Joe Klein because he's been picked on by so many people, no, not true. least of all me. Um, uh, I, I, you know, um, the no, well, better really better to pick on David Broder. Let's let's talk about David Broder yeah. because you use him you right. use him as an example of sort of, and and it's it's an apt example. In fact, the very day that you uh, wrote this piece, as my uh, fellow Atlantic blogger Matt Iglesias pointed out, hang mm -hmm. on, I'll, I'll pull up the. Uh, he ran a, a, a pull quote from your article, um, your piece, yes. which ran, if I can scroll down and find it. Yes, so you were, t you were criticizing Unity 08, which is a group that I've criticized on blogging heads before, so I won't bore our viewers, but, you know, basically right. the sort of 
embodiment of this kind of centrist liberalism is phony bipartisanship. Um, right. And then t today's David Broder column, or yesterday's David Broder column, I guess, includes the line, more than that, there is a palpable hunger among the public for someone who will attack the problems yeah. facing the country, the war in Iraq, immigration, right. energy, health care, and not worry about the politics. So right. what, what's, what's your theory of David Broder in particular? Well, because um, you come, you come, he, you come to Washington, you know, as a young yeah. guy, you know, starting out in journalism, and you look at figures uh -huh. like David Broder, and I always wonder what's going through his head when he writes a column like that. What What are your thoughts? My thoughts. Well, that, thank you for asking. Um, uh, I'm going to, I think, both answer your question and simultaneously plug my book, which is coming out in September. Um, uh, because Not I, a I, we're I think shameless the, here on blogging Hence TV. So. I think the answer can be found in Chapter Eight of my book, "The Big Con: The True Story of How Washington Got Hoodwinked and Hijacked by Crackpot Economics." Um, uh, wait, I, and, I have a, uh, I have a galley of that book. In fact, I'm going to hold my galley of the book up to the camera okay. in an amazing right. bit of, of synergy. So that's, there that's it is, so John Tate's book. People should know that the real, that's just the galley copy cover, and the real book cover is much better looking than that. Okay, well, I um, disregard it, what you've just seen then, America. Yeah, disregard. But um, that's not what you're going to be buying. You'll be buying something with the same title, but much much more attractive cover. Um, galley copies are just very um, uh, sort of tossed off. Anyway, so um, what, uh, basically the book is about the, 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 the triumph over the last three decades of far-right economics um, and how this, how this happened. And, and a big part of the story is basically the decline of the post-war consensus, how, how you used to have a rough consensus on the role of government in American life. Not that there was no disagreement, but, you know, you had um, the Republicans were figures like Eisenhower, Nixon, Ford, um, people whose, whose general concept of the role of government was not that different than, than what Democrats had. It was, just a, it was just a somewhat smaller, somewhat stingier version. And that consensus um, has disappeared. Uh, now, I, I would say it's obvious that the reason it's disappeared is that conservatives um, never agreed with the consensus and wanted to withdraw from it. And there's nothing wrong with that. You, there's no reason you... Consensus isn't good in and of itself. You don't have to agree with the consensus that you think is wrong. So they were totally right from their standard, from their standpoint, to do so. But nonetheless, they did. Um, but you have a lot of people. And Broder is a, you know, he's not young. He's been in Washington for a long time. Um, but there's a whole establishment in Washington that was um, sired in this worldview, um, and 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 the worldview they have made sense 30 years ago. Um, it's a worldview where, you know, there isn't a big difference between the two parties. All you really need to do is get a bunch of people in the room together, and if you get the right kind of people with the right sort of character, um, they can work things out and, and make the country a better place. And there is, you know, there isn't a whole lot of ideological disagreement about where to go. Um, so, so, but they can't recognize why this consensus has disappeared. Um, and because they're so wedded, especially Broder, who is, you know, to the nth and most comical degree, wedded to the notion of bipartisanship, um, of course it would be by, it would be partisan for him to say, well, the Republicans have withdrawn from it. Then he's being partisan. So that's that's partisanship is is wrong. It's the definition of wrongness. So um, so you know you, you can't you can't allow yourself to admit that. You can't even you know I don't I mean I don't think he's lying. I just don't think he's capable at this point of, of processing this reality anymore. Um, so basically, you you know you have a right that's withdrawn from it. Now, one of the reasons why, I, th I think you could argue actually the, the, the partisan angle two ways, of the kind, you know, the kind of journalism that he practices and the kind of conventional wisdom that he embodies. It hurts um, the right in the sense that their ideas are sort of just defined out of existence, right? It's just obviously true that we need to um, stop global warming and, and provide health care for all. You don't even need to deal with conservative ideas because um, you know, they're just out, you know, they're just not what there's just not what needs to be done. Period. You know they don't they don't acknowledge them. They don't engage with them. It just it's just ideology and it's just wrong. Um, and obviously that hurts the right. The way it hurts the left is that you do have a lot of people in the in the center who don't follow the policy debates very closely or in much detail. Um, and when you and basically they you know they're sort of against um, extremism. Right. And when you have one party that's been moving further and further to the right, like the Republican Party, further from the center, um, they don't really understand that, that that's the party that's moving away from the center. So you know the political science textbooks would say, well, this, the center if you move too far from the center, um, these centrist voters will punish punish you and vote. 
vote for the other party. And one of the reasons, there are a lot of reasons that's, that hasn't happened um, the way it should have, but, but one of them is you have all these people who can't, who, who think that the center is inherently the place between the two parties. So they can't understand or process or, or recognize when one of the parties is withdrawing from the center. So that's, that's kind of one of, the, one of the phenomena I try to explain in one of my, of my book, book chapters. Yeah, no, and I, I, mean, I've, I've, I've read uh, part, part, but not yet all of of the big con. I mean, I think I think one place, you know, for the sake of uh, some partisanship in this discussion, where, yeah. for for us to disagree a little bit, and I think this is a place where I disagree with a, a lot of um, a lot of observers who've argued that that the uh, Republican Party has moved to the right and taken the country with it. Mm-hmm. I, I agree with yeah. the first half of that statement, the idea that you know, right. yes, the particularly on on economics. Um, and I think you documented right. quite well in your book, the Republican Party, it hasn't just moved to the right. It has wedded itself to some very specific and somewhat marginal notions of how political economy works. I think that's that's mm-hmm. very clearly true. And those have been implemented in certain ways in policy. Um, I think that overall, though, uh, my sense is... On social issues, but even leaving yeah. leaving aside social issues, I mean, yes, yeah, let's yeah, let's yeah. let's let's agree. Which is not let, the topic of my book, to be fair. Right, but let let's agree that you know supply side economics specifically, you know, has in certain respects been implemented as policy in the United States. Yeah. Overall, I I, I would still argue that you know the the half of broderism that you described that sort of just marginalizes conservative ideas entirely, mm-hmm. um, rather than you know, splitting the difference and letting conservatives get away with extremism. I would argue that that's overall been more powerful. And, I mean, I think that, and, and, and you do actually talk about this in the book, the extent to which it isn't just, um, you know, liberals and centrists who have been sort of either taken in or failed to combat supply-side economics. It's the, the, the small government movement on the right has tended mm-hmm. to define its victories in terms of victories for supply-side economics. Um, yeah, but I, and, that's right. and we, so you know, and the Bush administration is the classic example where you know small government conservatives are told, well, here's what you get: you guys get tax cuts. And meanwhile, you know, right. we're just going to have deficit, deficit spending as far as the eye can see, and you're supposed to be happy with your tax cuts. Um, right. But I, but I think that you know part of this is the self-deception of sort of principled small government people on the right and the belief that well, you know the embrace of the starved beast theory of government, which turned out probably not to be true, you know, uh, as, ta- as tax rates go down, the size of government doesn't go down with it. If anything, it's the other way around. But part of it mm-hmm. is the persistent power of the Broder narrative, I think, which in which, you know, and you saw the Broder narrative at work the, the one time that the, um, you know, you actually had a sort of Republican governing movement that actually attempted to not, not so much shrink government but shrink the growth of government in the mid 1990s if you watched mm-hmm. how like time magazine covered newt gingrich for instance mm-hmm. i mean i I, I, yep. I, I think that I, I guess i'm just saying you know small government conservatives i think have a lot more to cl- complain about from from broderism than sometimes i get the sense that liberals think they do and you know post bush uh you know moving into the future i think while the republican party may have moved to the right it hasn't actually taken the government of the United States that far with it, but I don't, I don't know. What do you What do you think about that? Well, no. I, I mean, I, I think they have on, on on economic policy. They've moved. They've moved not only the guideposts of the debate, but I think they've moved policy itself. You know, very far to the right. You've got. Um, a, um, you know, you've defined the. It, it depends on how you define the right. They haven't made the size of government smaller, but I don't really think that's that's their goal. I mean, you have a lot of people in the movement who want that, but. Um, the people who are implementing the policies, I don't necessarily, necessarily think that's what they're principally after. I think the, 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 the central goal, or at least the thing that seems to unite all the wings of the Republican Party who have power is, is, is the upward redistribution of wealth. And I think they've, they've done that very successfully. Um, you know, in a period when we've had wealth becoming more and more and more concentrated, you've had uh, government... Um, not leaning against the wind, but running with the wind. But by, who, by who, are, who are these conservatives? I mean, you know, okay, maybe maybe Larry Kudlow. You know, I mean, I, yeah. obviously there are well, sort of conservative yeah. figures who would who might specifically say, you know, that they're in favor of the upward redistribution of wealth. Maybe. Yeah. But yeah, but, but I, I mean, who, 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 who are the who are the who, who are the who are the people in the conservative movement for whom this is 
a, an actual goal as opposed to they would see as a either meaningless or, you know, sort of natural corollary of greater economic freedom or something? Um, well, first of all, you, ha- you well, let me explain first broadly and then more specifically, and hopefully I won't take up too much time on this question. Um, I think you basically have two groups that have been driving the steering wheel for the Republican Party, and that's what I'm trying to write in my book. The two groups are the supply siders and K Street. And the upward redistribution of wealth is sort of the principle on, upon which they can unite because they don't agree on everything. You know, like supply siders don't care about you know, business subsidies. And, and K Street isn't all hung up on particular theories of, of, of margin. You know, they, they just want money, basically. You know, however, if it's delivered them in the form of marginal rate tax cuts or, or tax credits or direct subsidies, they don't care. They just want, you know, they just want to increase the bottom line. But, but where those two groups unite is, is the upward redistribution of wealth. That's sort of the sweet spot between them, and that's, that's where they've managed to kind of come together and, and, drive, and drive forward. Um, you know, in my, in my book, I've managed to quote um, quite a few conservatives, and I could have gone on, you know, more if, if, I, if, if I wasn't afraid of being repetitive. Um, you uh, had... Um, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm embarrassingly blanking on the name of the um, of Tony uh, Tony Snow, the um, the press secretary, yep. um, Bill Archer, the former uh, Ways and Means chairman, um, Phil Graham is I think I quoted, um, all saying to the effect things like um, what they say is like rich people have always driven society forward. They're the key to the economy. So if you sort of give them more. Um, it makes things better for everyone. That's sort of their root belief. So basically, it's not. And by give them more, you mean you mean uh, just just uh, to the more you mean money allow have, them the allow them to allow them to keep more of their income. Give allow them to keep more of their income, or just like the better they do. I mean, you know, right? So it's a, not, it's a not you're not you're technically right, giving them. I mean, they're just. <laughs> well, sometimes you are giving them. I mean, some, sometimes you you know you're just doing direct. You know, government subsidies of businesses. You're, you know, you're, 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 got, you're giving them money. You're, you're, you're doing government policy. Right, no, no, right, right. right. K Street, no, K Street. The K Street issue, the, the sort of government subsidies of business. I think is there. There, I think you're on safe ground. But I don't, I don't think it's quite the same thing as. Well, I don't know. I, I think you're, you're conflating, sort of the the principled pro growth argument, which you know may or not, may not be correct for. Having right. lower marginal tax rates on upper income Americans with the sort of you know with corporate welfare. Well, you know, um, for the second straight blogging head segment, I'm in a position where I wish I had my document that I was discussing in front of me, but I don't. Um, but uh, the some of the, most of what I'm dealing with is you know like supply side theory. But I I, I think you could find do, conservatives you, saying you, things. Do, 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 do you have the, the chapter chapter of the book? Because I, I have the uh, book in front of me. As, as, um, as well, I'm not going to have you look up my quotes for me. Oh, okay. uh, I think fair, fair enough. I'll, 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 I'll take your I'll take your word for it. Right. right. Yeah. The, the, Anyway, uh, I, I, you know, I think these are quotes that wouldn't necessarily be limited to defending policies just to cut tax rates or just just supply side policies. But basically, these are quotes that could be used in defense of anything that makes the rich richer. They're just they're what they're, 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 they're in other words they're not supply side quotes they're more um, just pro right they're more economic they're economic royalist quotes they're more like they're almost Burkean <coughs> in the sense of just believing that these people are the pillars of society and the better they do the better everyone off is you know um, I'm yeah so, I mean I'm not, I'm not well not sure that's a totally fair characterization of Burke but I we're right okay f- sure. Um, maybe maybe Manchester it's, it's, School liberalism or something. Although I don't know if they were. Uh, any, yeah. any, anyway, let's. Let, it's, or, it's a gospel, very royalist, go, we'll call it gospel um, of wealth, late nineteenth century. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Herbert Spencer, um, social Darwinism. Um, I really can't remember how we got off of this tangent anymore. I think we were just talking. Um, oh, we I'm were talking about whether you know to the what, what extent what extent the Republicans in particular have moved the country materially to the right. Yeah. Right. Um, it, it, right. It just seems to me that you're sort of defining the American right on, you know, the you sort of found the place where certain elements of the right can claim to have achieved something, which you know they they have achieved. What they've achieved uh-huh. is, you know, I, partially the result of their own labors, but I think largely the result, you know, the trends, the the, the larger economic trends towards um, uh, higher incomes at the at the upper brackets 
I mean, there's obviously some debate about this, but I, I, don't, I don't think, you know, the, the U.S. tax policy has been the driving force behind those trends. So I don't think that's right. I, yeah, I agree with that. But I, I think public policy has definitely played a role, but I don't think tax policy has played a huge role. It's only in the sense of the after tax. You know, it's, it's, it's basically the rich are getting richer and they're paying And they're paying less in, ta- right, less in taxes, although they are technically Which is, you know, paying more money in tax. I mean, just to... I, more, I, would more be, I would be remiss if I weren't making the Larry Kudlow point here, since he's not here to defend uh, his right. point of view. But Right, and I would be remiss if I didn't proceed to jump down your throat, so allow me. Go for um, it. This is what, what you're sort of hinting at, although I don't think you actually believe, is, is this view that you constantly see, you know, Kudlow, Wall Street Journal editorial page make, that the rich are getting socked. In fact, the Wall Street Journal constantly describes the situation as Marxist because uh, the rich are paying so much more in taxes. But, of course, what's happening is that the rich are making so much more money that even the fact that their tax rate is declining isn't, doesn't, isn't enough to keep them from paying, you know, a higher level of taxes. So their, their, their wealth, their income share is going higher and higher and higher. Their tax rate is going lower and lower and lower. But the first trend is outpacing the second. So they're ending up paying, you know, more, right. a higher share of the tax burden. No, and right. I, don't, so, which I, is, don't, I don't, I don't. Whatever that is, it's not Marxist. It's no, not, it's, not, you know, it's not Marxist. And I, but what, what's, what I think is actually is. interesting, what, what you see with Kudlow and the Wall Street Journal uh, editorial page and what, what I think, uh, goes back actually to the late 1970s and the sort of, I'm not sure you could call it a devil's bargain, but the bargain that small government conservatives made when they embraced supply side ec- economics. Right. What, what the supply siders want, as far as I can tell, I, I would say their, their defining principle um, mm-hmm. is, is the idea of growth. And they're, they're, they constantly refer to themselves as pro-growth. This is something Kudlow talks about all the time. And this is, to, yeah. you know, it's the sort of, it's the high-minded flip side of what, you know, you sort of impute the low-minded motives of, you know, helping, helping their neighbor buy another yacht. The high-minded motive is, you know, economic growth is a good in and of itself. It's rising tides lifts all boats. It's good for society, blah, blah, blah. Um, right. Growth is not, you know, growth is sort of a secondary principle of traditional small government conservatism, which is which mm-hmm. is premised on greater freedom. And what, you know, and, and, and this is the place, I think, where sometimes Kudlow talks about sort of class envy and Marxism and so on. But sometimes, I think this is the more revealing thing. He, he'll say, well, look, you know, mm-hmm. the, the tax revenues are surging in the Bush years, which they are, because... Precisely right. because the rich are getting well, no, they're surging. They're surging. They're surging over the last few years. They're not surging over. They collapsed in the first. Right, they years collapsed in the. But, but over over the last two years, they've been surging above right. ex, above expectations, right? And one right. of the reasons after collapsing far below expectations, right? But one of the reasons they're surging above expectations is that precisely that the rich are getting richer, therefore they're paying more in taxes, therefore federal revenues yes. are rising, right? And, right. and sometimes because a bigger share is going to people pay higher rates, right? And so Kudlow, and so often Kudlow will defend. Um, you know, tax cuts and supply side theory in this light, saying, "Well, look, it's mm-hmm. you know, it can't be bad because it's giving the government more more money." And this was actually something that uh, you saw in in the nineteen in the late seventies and and with Reagan. It's sort of the original. Um, it's it's the way out of the you know the tax cuts uh, cut revenue. Therefore, we have to defund social programs. Therefore, we won't be popular trap that right. conservative tax cutters used to find themselves in, they say, oh, no, right. tax cuts will actually raise revenue and the government will have even more money. And this, I right. think, is this, is this is the place where, you know, I, I think principled small government conservatives tend to sort of go along with this, often without thinking about what it means. And what it actually means is that even the supply, the supply siders are actually the real big government conservatives in that sense. That, I think... That's right. In the sense, of, well, certainly it's true in the sense that they don't care about government spending very much at all. Right. They're happy to agree to higher or lower spending, whatever it is that will politically allow them to lower taxes. So if they can, if they can convince people that revenues will rise and get the spenders on board, they'll do that. If they can convince people we'll starve the beast, they'll do that. They're basically agnostic about anything on the re- on the expenditure side of the equation. They just want lower taxes. Period. Right. Now, actually. Um, the extent to which they believe that tax cuts cause revenues to grow is a little bit debatable. Um, after the 80s, they, uh, they would furiously deny ever having said such a thing. Um, that was considered a real slander to say that the supply side said that revenues would grow. They would say, we never said that, we never said that. They had said that, but then, then they, then that became, you know, that went down the memory hole. They, well, you also have to, you also have to they distinguish they between, between now, like, the, now, they're, now they're back to just saying it again. Right, but uh, you have to distinguish between, like, right. 
I mean, and and this is obviously a distinction that conservatives themselves don't make enough, but between, you know, the Bruce Bartlett's and the Larry Kudlow's, the sort of, the principled, you know, supply side case and the sort of any port in a storm, you know, everything's coming up roses, right. um, um, cheerleaders. But there's one Bruce Bartlett and there are like dozens of Kudlow's. <laughs> I mean, that. Who else would you put in the Bartlett category as a supply side? Well, no, I mean, now, now we're getting... No, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to duck out of this topic. You, you, if you get me too far into economic policy, my ignorance becomes too uh, too glaringly apparent. So let's... let's I'm to, actually let's, shocked that you've agreed to... The, to to go this far, yeah. No, well, let's let's turn from this for a second then, actually, and, sure. and, and talk uh, for a minute about the Democrats, because, you know, one tying into my personal thesis that, you know, the, the country, the sort of movement that the uh, conservatives have accomplished over the past five or ten or twenty years isn't that mm-hmm. significant is my my current sense that you know these are actually really good times potentially to be a liberal slash progressive slash big government person whatever you want to call it that things are really moving in um, liberal big government's direction on a variety of fronts um, both in terms of um, uh, public opinion and in terms of trends within the Democratic Party, um, and so I was I was curious to get your take on that. A while back, maybe a year ago now, actually, you wrote a piece called "Freak Outnomics" um, about um, I'm going to bastardize it a little bit, but about the convergence to a certain extent between what were the two major factions in, de- in the Democratic Party in the 1990s, where economic policy were concerned, the uh, Rubenites, and then the People, I mean, maybe you could associate them with Robert Reich, or is it Reich or Reich? Reich. Reich. Yes, I thought so. Yeah. Yes. So, so Robert Reich. But basically, you know, uh, the sort of neoliberal cut the deficits and, and so on, folks, and the people who are more concerned about poverty and inequality. Um, and you were arguing that you know the failure of. Uh, well, here, you know what? Why don't you just summarize your argument? This is silly. What were no, you arguing? No, you got it. You're, you're doing great. You're, you're far too modest. Um, you're right. I was arguing about the convergence where um, essentially the, um, the conservative faction within the Democratic Party has to some extent um, become less certain about where it wants to go um, because um, their remedies seem less applicable to the world that we find ourselves in now as opposed to the world we found ourselves in in the early 1990s, um, whereas the, the facts as we see them now do seem more friendly to those of the of the more liberal, you know, labor populist wing. So you you have in part you have the kind of Rubin faction maybe slightly moving to the left or at least being more willing to consider ideas that they were hostile to in the in the nineteen nineties. That's that's kind of what I but yeah, no, I think you had it pretty well. Well right, and so that's going on at the same time as you have both, you know, generally largely because of the Iraq war, you have a large scale revulsion against uh, the Republican Party. Um, yeah. And that combined with sort of a steady uptick since the early 1990s in polls, you know, people saying whether the government should fund universal health care, whether they're willing to pay higher taxes, even, even for anti-poverty programs, you have, you know, numbers inching ever higher, above 50 yeah. percent, towards 60 percent, and so on. And so mm-hmm. on, on my blog, I've been arguing recently that, you know, that, that and I think it was, it was touched off because uh, Matt Taby, who's this sort of constant provocateur, wrote this piece, uh, you know, bemoaning the shabby state of liberalism, and liberals are ashamed to call themselves liberals, and they're washed up and out of date, and the kind of piece that people have written a lot of over the last 10 years, and I was sort of annoyed by it and said, look, Longer. you know, stop, yeah, so 30 years, <laughs> stop, stop bitching, um, you control basically both houses of Congress, you're in a really good position for 08, and the sort of, uh, what, what I take to be the, basically the animating vision of liberalism in this country, which is that the U.S. should have more social democracy rather than less, I think is in uh-huh. better shape now than it's been at any point since, I don't know, the 1970s maybe? I mean, there was a slight uptick in the numbers if you look at, like, polling on size of government questions and health care and so yeah. on in the late 80s, and that eventually led to Clinton being elected. But but it dropped right. off pretty quickly again. And, and now you It seen, dropped off pretty quickly, right. Yeah, and now you're seeing a really steady uptick in those numbers, and it's good times for the Democrats. So what, what, do, what do you think? Well, you know, I don't think I'm telling you anything you don't know, but um, the, the, the underlying rationale has always been that that, Ameri- that there's a huge split between the way um, Americans look at these questions uh, in the abstract and the way they look at it in, in the specific. Right. In the abstract, 
they're, they're, it's either, you know, various points of time, they're either somewhat liberal or extremely liberal in terms of their preferences. They always want to basically make the rich pay higher taxes. They, they, they don't want to cut any major social programs or defense. But basically, if you read them, you know, the entire federal budget, almost all of it they would put off limits um, or increase. Right. They want, they're willing to pay higher taxes to increase health care and education and, and lots of things. Um, that's basically always true. But in the abstract, they're still, you know, skeptical about government, largely because, you know, I think polls also show they just don't know very much about what government does. They think foreign aid is a huge component of the government or, uh, you know, they just don't, you know, or just like bureaucracy, but they don't really have a good sense of, you know, what those programs are. Um, so, you know, um, Or maybe, that's, maybe they're that's smarter still, than you think they are. No, I, go, go on, sorry. No, I mean, it's just, it's just not, it's just not true, right? I mean, look, Medicare, you know, Social Security is you know huge program. There's there's just no bureaucracy there. It's just che- all the money goes and checks to old people. Um, uh, you know, M- Medicare has a, has a little more, but not very much. Um, right. No defense, people. The program. Those, right. The, the program <coughs> that both interest I on think, the national debt, etc. Right. And, and I know, and I think I think it's true that the the program, and you see this on the conservative side. There's a reason that conservatives are always going after pork busting and and, and so on. I mean, the yeah. the programs that are examples, I think of you know, why the conservative critique of government is often true, you know, that, that it doesn't work very well, are, yeah, a sort of fractional proportion of the federal budget overall. Right. No, I, I, I think that's true. Um, wait, what was I, I was about to say? Right, well, so, so, so there's this divergence, and the, the, um, the American Prospect um, actually has a cover package that's a series of articles on, you know, what the gov- Democrats do now, and one of them includes a piece by Stanley Greenberg, the Democratic pollster, laying out all these numbers saying, well, you know, even now, even with the turn to the left in public opinion, distrust yeah. for government is is higher than ever. Um, you know, people think government programs don't work, blah, blah, blah. And Greenberg blames this on, on Bush and the Republicans for destroying the public's trust in government, which I think is sort of a half-truth. Mm-hmm. I mean, yes, you know, the Bush administration has been incompetent in many ways, and people trust government less than they did five years ago, but the baseline numbers for trust in government have been more or less the same low. and yeah low low for a long time yeah. going back to the you know i looked at pew and it goes back to the 80s and obviously it goes back before then so and and that goes to your point about sort of the persistent theoretical public distrust for government so so what are what so what what should the democrats do with this landscape um john Shea, democratic strategist <laughs> Oh, uh, well, this was not on the list of prepared questions. Uh, well, I know. Uh, I, well, I, I mean, I, well, here I'll tell you what I'll tell you what I think. Um, okay, I, I think that, and, and this is sort of this is a cop out answer, but I think uh, the Democrats need a messenger really badly, um, and, I, yeah. and and I think they they found what you saw in the last race um, in in 0, 06 was um, both sort of savvy management by everyone from Pelosi and Reid in the Congress leading up to the election to Rahm Emanuel and so forth. But you also saw, you know, some very attractive Democratic candidates articulating, you know, often demagogically, but this sort of new, more lefty Democratic message from, you know, John mm-hmm. Tester, James, Jim Webb, Sherrod Brown, and so forth, and yep. and thereby winning in swing states. And, I mean, I think that going into 08, and, and I'm not sure actually what this means for who the Democrats should vote for in the primary, because I'm not sure who the ideal messenger is. But I think it's clear that, I I don't think it's clear, I think it's possible that this is an election where, you know, you you really, this this is a big opportunity for the Democrats. And if there's a possibility Mm -hmm. of finding a Democratic Reagan-type figure, rather than just nominating someone who will win with 51% of the vote. You really want to, you want to take that gamble. This is an election to throw the dice. But I, yep. yeah, I, I mean, and that sort of inclines... Which me. means Obama, right? Well, I mean, that, that's yeah, that's sort of, that, that, that's what makes me go towards Obama. Now, the, the irony of the situation, as, as your colleague Noam Shiver was just writing about, is that, you know, the, the people that the Democrats want to reach in, you know, the swing voters they want to reach, or tend to be sort of working class to middle class voters, um, you know, people in Virginia and Ohio sort of suburbs and so on. Those people who are Democrats, uh, working class Democrats, are Hillary people right now. So yeah, there is, although I, I think... Well, go, go ahead. I think that's more... Well, you know, I, I think it's more, uh, you know, a high information, low information voter split. 
Um, that's whatever. I mean, you had the same thing in um, in two thousand four between Carey and Edwards, where you had more um, educated people were, were for Edwards and the less were for were for Carey. Um, but it, because I think you had you know the low information voters, all they knew was that Carey had won the Iowa primary and. You know, so he's the winner and he's the guy. If you're not paying that much attention, you that's what comes what, what comes through. So, right. uh, you know, I don't think that meant that Kerry had more authentic working class appeal than John Edwards. Not that Edwards was perfect, but 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 Kerry, you know, on a scale of one to ten, would be about negative three. Right. <laughs> so you think so you think there's plenty of, I mean, I think the the danger with Obama is that you know it's it's clear that he's somebody who gets people very excited. It's clear that he's overall, you know, he at, at the moment he, he scores very well with independents, much better than Hillary and so on. The, the danger is that in sort of crucial situations like suburban white Ohio, that he just somehow fails to connect because he comes across as too black, too multicultural, too Harvard. I, you know, I don't know what. I, I, I think that's... Which is, which is, and I, I think, the, and the other risk is that he just gets, you know, what do they say about about what they want to do to Clinton, like in '92, open him up like a soft peanut that, you know, he's right. never run a race against a real Republican candidate, and right, and Hillary, Hillary yeah, no, I, yeah. although you could argue, you could and the Hillary people, go on, go on. Sorry. I was just going to say, and I mean, the best thing I think you could say for Clinton is that she's surrounded by by the first stringers, the people who who have been through this and know what they're doing. They're you know they're 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 real professionals in, in Clinton's. And Obama's team is a little less tested, so you know, I again, I, I I think the political argument for Obama is is stronger, but that's the best case I would make for Clinton. Mm-hmm. Should we um, move on to your point about Cheney? Because I think you've been um, overly generous. In allowing the debate to kind of center on, you know, things I've written, um, ideas sure. that are close well, to my let's, heart. Let's, this this is sort of a uh, kind of nebulous and half thought out point, but I, I've found the um, I just did a blog post about it, uh, and yeah, I, I found the I don't know if you've been reading the post has just embarked on one of their you know sure. five hundred thousand word series on Dick Cheney and. The first, yeah. I think the second part runs today, which I haven't read yet. The first part was just sort of an overview of, of, of how Cheney operates within the White House and, you yeah. know, sort of going behind people's back, avoiding the chain of command, going directly to the president, sort of using the ambiguity of his office, which is, you know, doesn't traditionally play a big role in the White House, to affect policy, outwit people bureaucratically, and so on. Um, mm-hmm. So, so that's what that's sort of the overall vision of the piece. But there are lots of interesting anecdotes, like his his reaction, you know, sort of watching, sitting in the White House bunker, watching the you know planes go into the towers, and everybody else is gasping, and Cheney is just sort of sitting there, completely stoic, I think, or with you know with his fingers together and so on. Um, right. So there's lots of good stuff. But in, anyway, that that's not totally germane to my point, which is. You know, so there's there's this game in Washington that everybody plays now, which I've played too, which is the sort of what what happened to Dick Cheney game, right? You know, mm-hmm. and and Cheney was you know supposed to come in as sort of the adult, the sober-minded, hard-edged, but very realistic um, sort of almost father figure to George W. Bush in this administration, and in fact he's been associated with arguably some of the more reckless policies the administration has pursued. Um, you know, he's mm-hmm. a guy who had a reputation as chief of staff in the, in the Ford administration for being, you know, somebody yeah. who was all about respecting the process, you know, don't let your personal views, um, you know, sort of dominate discussion with the president, you know, have this, right. this sort of, and, and that's gone out the window too, obviously. And right. sort of, so, so there's this question floating around, and I... One one thing that struck me, and I, I, is that I think one one danger for people, and I, I think you'll see this particularly if if the Democrats win in 08, as they have a very good chance of doing, um, but it, is that the the kind of behaviors that Cheney has um, indulged in, um, while they're particularly unique because you've never had a vice president really engaging in them, and maybe that's what makes them particularly pernicious, but the sort of overall attitude towards America at wartime seems to be really characteristic of nearly every administration faced with a serious military threat over the course of the last 70 years of American history from you know from Woodrow Wilson imprisoning 
you know, it, Eugene Debs and his political enemies down through the internments of Manzanar, you know, including, yeah, I mean, we can debate whether the use of the atomic bomb by, by Truman was necessary and so on, but I, I think you can make a strong case that Truman bombing Hiroshima and Nagasaki were worse than Guantanamo Bay, for instance. I mean, not, not to get too lost in the weeds, but then down through yeah. Johnson, Nixon, and so forth. And, you know, the, then you have the question of, well, is the war on terror or whatever you want to call it really as serious as some of those threats? Maybe not. But it, it, it just struck me that, you know, I think there's a danger in making too much of Cheney in particular because he's been the vehicle through which the sort of imperial presidency tendencies have manifested themselves in this case, and making too uh -huh. little of the fact that, you know, this, this is what tends to happen to U.S. government in different ways in wartime. And these are, the, you know, and, and these are things that are going to continue to exist and temptations that are going to continue to exist even when a new administration and a democratic administration even is in power. So that was sort of my vague you know, off, off, right. offhand point. It was, you know... It was. It's a good point. It's well taken, and um, uh, and in all sincerity, like so many of your of your blog posts, very smart and interesting. And one of the things that makes you, I think, such an interesting writer. But in this case, um, you know, I think I think he went too far. Um, <laughs> like Cheney himself. <laughs> like Cheney himself. Um, you're a madman. You've got to be stopped, Ross. What, you, the, what happened to the old saying, Ross? Doubt that. Uh, that's what I want to know. Um, I was no, just I was just right. googling around. I, I was looking for a picture of Cheney to put up with the blog post, and I couldn't find one, or not before we started this 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 yeah. encounter. But I, I found this thing I'd seen before, and it was like the, the six ways Dick Cheney can kill you. Have you have you seen this? No, oh, it's fantastic. It's it's just got um, it's got these pictures of him, and I'm you know you can't see it, but photos of him holding his hands in different ways, um, uh, and and then you know and so it lists brilliant. like the six ways are karate chop. Or, you know, impalement, yeah. and he's pointing with a finger. Or he's pointing with his finger as a gun, and it's shooting you. Anyway, I'm, Obviously I, I just, an I just had to share that with, with our, our viewers. So, yeah. so go on. So, uh, Cheney, why am let, I wrong? Let, oh, sorry. <laughs> sure. Uh, um, well, y you made the comparisons to uh, Roosevelt and Wilson. Uh, and, I, and you're right that the, the things that they did were much worse, much more anti-democratic, much more draconian. But, you know, in any historical comparison, I think you, you've got to consider the standards of the day um, as, as your, you know, look, um, if, um, if, if Cheney um, enslaved people and kept them in the White House grounds as slaves, well, you could say, well, look, he's no different than Thomas Jefferson. But that wouldn't be a good argument because, you know, slavery has a different place in society now. Well, don't and, get and, me started and, and, on and Jefferson, it, but no, go on, go on, sorry. Um, um, you know, and the same thing is this, this, the country has become more democratic that, you know, um, the uh, alien and sedition laws or, or you know, the, the kind of crackdowns that, that happened during World War One are just fundamentally unacceptable. And now, in a way, they weren't then. I mean, they were controversial then. Uh, and, and the internment of Japanese was controversial. But um, the, our standards have changed. So I think, you know, basically you have to judge people against changing standards. That would be my main... My no, main I, I, think, I think that's a fair point. I mean, the, the, uh, w one thing I'd say is that you know, you don't want to underestimate some, you know, there are changing standards. There's also a changing sense of America's um, power in the world and the nature of the threats we face. And the mm -hmm. sort of, and, you know, the, the part of what enabled, like, you know, Manzanar and the internment of Japanese Americans was clearly the sense that internment was a more reasonable policy than most people would think it is today. Some of what enabled it, mm -hmm. though, was the fact that, you know, the Japanese were not a terrorist group, but an actual nation that had bombed uh, one of our cities, and people were worried that they were going to attack the west coast of the United States, and and so on. I mean, I, I think that you know, there's there's changing mores. There's also changing circumstances, and the U.S. is. I think people feel comfortable being more democratic or more human rights oriented now, in part because the U.S. seems, you know more secure in, in certain ways. And I know that's sort of a weird mm -hmm. thing to say, because, like, in the age of terror, you know, we're so insecure, and this was the first attack on mainland America, and, and, and so on. But I, I don't know. I, I just think you, you shouldn't underestimate how much some of that is just America's changing role in the world, maybe. Well, true, but even in the most fear-drenched days after September 11th, no one in public life 
I didn't even think Ann Coulter was contemplating, you know, pu- public description. Well, okay, forget it. I want to say not, never say not even Ann Coulter. Um, no one. Well, you did have Michelle Malkin Hussein. making the case for internment. Of, as, I never actually That's read right. read her book, so I'm not sure who she wanted to intern specifically. It never got a serious hearing in the public agenda, even relatively mild discriminatory measures. You know, even the idea of, you know, like, how about we only search, you know, people from Arab, of Arab or Muslim descent or, or you know, from those countries in, in the airplane lines and let, and let um, everyone else go through. Even that didn't get much of a public hearing, which I'm not saying I'm in favor of it. Um, no, no, that's, that's, you know, that's so true. I guess I'm just, I just wonder... Um, I, I, I agree with you. Times have changed. Mores have changed. I just wonder, and this is getting a feel from the Cheney point, but, you know, if there had been two more 9-11s after 9-11, you know, it, it, right. two, two more serious bombings. Like, the thing with Pearl Harbor was that, you know, Pearl Harbor happened and you had an aggressive power making war on the United States in a way, you know, Osama mm-hmm. bin Laden just isn't. And I just, I, I just wonder, you know, it's the whole... I mean, I think people, uh, maybe Peter Barnard, your old boss at TNR, has talked a lot about this. But like, you know, one of one of the reasons liberals need to win the war on terror is because if you know the more terrorism is there is, the more liberalism comes under assault. And I, I, I think that, that yeah. I, I'd be, I mean, I wouldn't be curious to see because it would be terrible. But mm-hmm. it would, it would be. I, I do. I wonder. Yeah. I, 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 yeah, I'm that's, rephrasing that's this badly, but I wonder. I wonder yeah. what would happen in the United States and what kind of options would be on the table had 9/11 been, you know, marginally worse than it was. But, um, but yeah, it, on on the Cheney point, I, I mean, I guess the one. Yeah. It, it it just sort of s- struck me. Seeing, oh, I, yeah. It, what what it was, I, I remember during the uh, defense uh, case for Scooter Libby. They entered into mm-hmm. the record um, some account of like a typical morning briefing that he got during okay. this period when um, you know when he was supposed to have forgotten his conversation with Tim Russert and John sure. Horitz reproduced it in his column and made made a column out of it. Now it, it was it was kind of I mean it wasn't like unexpected but it it was kind of remarkable just to think about what you mm-hmm. see every day as you know Dick Cheney's chief of staff and therefore what Dick right. Cheney sees every day and it's just. Yeah, I'll, I'll, again, I'll be curious. <laughs> I wonder what yeah. will happen um, when it's a Democratic administration facing those kinds of challenges. And, you know, you have to remember that right. a lot of some of, you know, a lot of the stuff that Cheney and others have pushed for is, you know, no no one to the left of, you know, Bill O'Reilly has advocated anything remotely similar. But the sort of the first wave of things, the Patriot Act and so forth, were all things that the Clinton administration in a peacetime context had had supported right. and yeah so yeah well you know what I'm happy to indulge your cheerful curiosity and if there is another uh, terrorist attack that leads to the establishment of you know some kind of fascist dictatorship in the United States um, you know I'll owe you a coke uh, <laughs> a, a, for, a, a vanilla, know, unfortunately coke will be banned and we'll be an all Pepsi right, country we'll, we'll be in re-education I'll, I'll give you the, a, the, I'll give you some some of the gruel for my bowl in our, our re-education camp. sounds sounds good. Um, well, well, maybe we should end things here because I, I don't sure. want to acquire cancer from my cell phone. Not that you can acquire cancer from your cell phone, but, you know, hypothetically. Right. Um, but it's been uh, really fun talking to you, John. And hopefully, it's been a great pleasure, Hopefully Ross. we can do it again soon. I would like that. All right. Okay. Great. Thanks. Bye. Bye.